Morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank OWASP for doing this. I want to also thank those of you who helped close down the bar last night for actually showing up this morning. That was uh, pretty good. And I, I actually have now made a commitment that as much as I've been involved with OWASP, I too have been one of those who've always been out there and not a member, so I am going to become a member. So it's a great organization. Appreciate what you're doing with that. So if we can flip the slides, put that... And uh, today I, I really wanted to go through and, and share with you some of my perspectives on uh, having been both in the government, uh, both in the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. I, I, that's where I ran our software assurance program, our supply chain risk management program, and in particular our security automation. That's where a lot of our resources went towards, and I'm going to share some of that, how we've been leveraging that within industry, because I'd started that when I was actually in DOD, and it's been industry who's been leveraging that. And so I really want to share with you today what you can do to get away from this victim mentality that the world is going bad, but we can actually do something to reduce the attack vectors and, and really enable the things that we've been trying to do with DevOps, but focus on rugged DevOps, or some people will call it secure DevOps. And I, I think that's important, but part of it, like, I have to share a journey. Of the organization that I'm in right now, I'm in Synopsys, and probably many of you have never even heard of Synopsys. I have to say, honestly, I didn't know who they were a few years back. Uh, but they, uh, globally, Synopsys is number one in the area of electronic design automation and number two in the area of semiconductor IP. You can go, well, okay, big deal. What's that all about? Well, as a result of it, Synopsys worldwide is the 16th largest producer of software. And, and that's where Synopsys got this understanding that we have to focus on quality and security. And I, I bring that up is because that's where it shows the corporate commitment to what we're doing as far as what we're focusing on internally because the intellectual value, the intellectual property that we have within Synopsys is tied up in software. And as, as a result of that, uh, I, I think that most of you understand if the fact that you're sitting in this audience is that a lot of people focus on different aspects of the critical infrastructure. And it kind of depends on where you are. You might be supporting the financial sector. You might be in the telecom area. You might even be in the energy sector. But in all instances, well, most people out there or citizens always look at, they look at the physical infrastructure. And that's very important. But the fact that you're here, you understand that the physical infrastructure that we as society rely upon today relies upon the cyber infrastructure that is both software enabled and software controlled. The, the challenge we have is the more you peel back the onion, you kind of said, I didn't want to know that. You know, when you see how it's fraught with exploitable weaknesses, vulnerabilities, in some cases malware as well. And there's both uh, unauthentic and counterfeit co components in that as well. And the growing challenge is that it's an ever more com connected world. And uh, so we, we see all the things that we rely upon, and now we're making it all interconnected. Uh, to a point that things that were not designed or deployed to be interconnected are now interconnected, and we kind of wonder, well, no wonder it's exploitable. And we're, we're seeing that it's uh, being exploitable from, from the edge devices, from the IoT platforms, to the enterprise. And uh, there's various ways, depending on where you're trying to attack it, but hacking has become a normal course of what everyone else is doing. And it's, it's leading to the fact that it's got a lot of people concerned, given the fact that the Internet of Things is here, and it's becoming all more pervasive. And why do we care about that? Well, it really comes down to a lack of security for the growing number of these IoT embedded devices in our appliances, industrial applications, and it ranges from everything that we deal with today. In fact, it's not maliciousness that we need to be so concerned about. Yes, we do. But what we need to be more concerned about is the fact that there's sloppy manufacturing hygiene that is compromising privacy, safety, and security simply for incurring the time to market type thing. They're not paying attention to it. As a result of that, IoT risks provide more uh, source vectors for financial exploitation as well as privacy exploitation. But here's the rub. And this is why... Congress is even getting involved with this, is that IoT risks are evolving from virtual harm to physical harm. We're seeing cyber exploitation with physical consequences. 
increased risk of bodily harm from hacked devices. I, and I know everyone here has seen different ones all the way from automobiles to medical devices. It's just reality. And the concern we have is the fact that companies who are producing these are not paying attention to it. In fact, in February of this year, the Bar Group released the survey results where they had surveyed 2,400 engineers. Now, you note I'm saying the engineers, not the lawyers, from the companies who are producing these IoT embedded devices. And the results were, they said 22% uh, of them can kill. They said our devices can kill people because our company is not paying attention to safety and security. Poorly designed embedded devices can kill. Security is not taken seriously enough. And proactive techniques for increasing safety and security are used less often than they should be. Coming from the engineers of the companies who are producing this. And that's what's scary. Because what is the incentive for those companies to change? Well, we have seen liability starting to become this big picture thing that companies do pay attention to. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, we were uh, had already been focusing on quality, and we started focusing more on quality and safety. Now, safety actually has a lot of regulatory requirements, and, and that's what's making people, if you're in a safety critical aspect, you're, you're going to be focusing on these things because people are checking you. But where we are today is it's got to be quality, security, safety, and privacy. In fact, my contention is if you cannot demonstrate that a product is secure, you cannot claim that it's safe. You cannot claim that it's reliable. And, and that's going to be very important. And I, I, I'll give you a classic example. 9-11, uh, perhaps the most defining event that we had in U.S. history, actually caused the stand-up of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. It's a classic example where systems that had been designed, built, and deployed to be safe, but because they were not designed, built, and deployed to be secure, hundreds of people died. And I asked the safety guys, I said, so what about that? And they said, well, that's a security issue. I said, hundreds of people died. How is that safe? Show me in your hazard analysis, which is required by law, that you at least made some security assumptions, that somebody had done that. Well, the answer was no. It's almost like we do these two separate things, safety and security. But again, you cannot assert something is safe or reliable in today's environment if you do not understand that it's secure. So we today are relying on a global supply chain. Everything, we, we have all these external dependencies where we turn to others and that's just a fact of life. We don't produce everything on our own. Independent of who your organization is, you bring in products from others. We have this re increasing reliance on globally sourced information communications technology and the software and services. We have varying levels of development and outsourcing controls. There's a lack of transparency in the process chain of custody. In fact, if you look at your supply chain, there are people who are involved in your supply chain who you would not allow into your building without escort but you will just take their product and install it into your network. Now, you have to understand, this is not saying foreign is bad. What I'm saying is if you don't understand who's in your supply chain, because just because it's domestic doesn't make it good, because it comes down to do they have the wherewithal, the capabilities of delivering secure products. And, and that's some of the things that you have to understand. And we have various levels of acquisition due diligence. People simply aren't checking. They're finding out it's cheaper to buy it on eBay than going through the original equipment manufacturer. And they're wondering, why are we getting these defective or counterfeit or products that have malware in it? And as a result of that, we're getting all this residual risk that's being passed on to the end user enterprise. And it comes in the form of defective and unauthentic products, tainted products that have malware, exploitable weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and services that lack adequate security controls. And what we're finding is that while your organization might be really better today at protecting your perimeter, we're finding the new favorite vector of attack is the supply chain. In fact, it's the software in the supply chain that is so much easier to compromise your organization than to try to break through your firewalls or your DMZs. And as a result of that, what we're finding is that enterprises are waking up to this they, they've got a lot of regulatory compliance, a changing threat environment, it's a business case. They're making their own risk management uh, decisions based on that. But even when they know that everything that they have is not everything they want it to be, they turn to a project or a program. And at that level, we treat risk management, and I know you can all say this in your sleep, 
Risk management is cost, schedule, and performance. Cost, schedule, and performance. And it seems like our acquisition and procurement people focus on cost and schedule. Performance, well, if it's on contract. Well, if you fail to articulate needs for secure software, do you think you're going to get it? See, our, that's our challenge because contracts become the vehicle by which we communicate our requirements. And as a result of all of this, who's making risk decisions? As you follow that supply chain, you will understand there are people who are making risk decisions on your behalf, and it's not their risk. They're just passing that on, residual risk uh, that will go on, or some people will refer to it as technical debt. They are determining the fitness for use. You are not. You have to be in a position where you can do that. And who owns that residual risk? Well, we understand that we're the ones who do that. Now, there's some simple things I can use as examples. If you've ever been in, in, in actually developing software, so I'm speaking to most of the audience here, I've, I've asked people when they're delivering the software, I said, so for this, this product that you're delivering to me, were any compiler warning flags disabled? And people say, well, you don't care about that. I said, well, actually, I do. And let me explain to you why. Uh, because virtually every programming language is, has exploitable vulnerabilities in it. The, the language itself is. Now, you can use it more securely, but that's where the compiler vendors have come in. So we stood up a group many years ago with an ISO, IEC, JTC1, SC22, a new working group, 23, that dealt with vulnerabilities in programming languages. And all the compiler vendors were members of that. And today, with modern compilers, you are getting warning flags based on what we're going to be talking about later on, the common weaknesses. And so you will now get warning flags that says there's something wrong here. Well, developers are getting very annoyed by those. And so they disable the compiler warning flags. Just, just, just turn it off. It's not their risk. It's my risk. And that's what I try to explain. To, you have a much different conversation with your developers when you ask that question, were any compiler warning flags disabled? Explain to me why you don't think it's a risk to me. What we're finding, though, today is that people are not paying attention to the supply chains. In fact, uh, when, uh, Pricewaterhouse did a uh, survey. They said only 19% of CIOs, uh, well, 19% of them are not even concerned about supply chain risk. Only 42% of the respondents consider supply chain risk. And 23% do not evaluate third parties at all. And you have to understand that if, if you see the external dependencies that we have on our supply chain and you're not checking it, it's kind of like shame on us. And, and that's why I said in today's environment, if you don't bring in both quality, safety, and security, you cannot have trust. Quality for years, we've had that because it's about dealing with the uh, managing effects of unintentional defects. Uh, safety has been managing consequences of unintentional defects. But security is a little bit different. It's about managing effects and consequences of attempts or intentional actions targeting exploitable construct processes and behaviors. If you don't address security, you don't get the others. And the trust really relies on that. And so you, being in the OWASP audience, fundamentally understand that security is very important. So how do we do that? Well, most organizations have uh, understood that we've been buying and deploying fundamentally non-secure, or products that are weak. And so we've been doing the, the bolt-on security. We put in our DMZ. We put in our firewall. We pray a lot. It's, uh, and then, we, you know, the intrusion detection systems have been very important, intrusion prevention. And I remember I was speaking to an audience a few years ago, and an individual in the back of the room stood up. He said, you know, ever since they made us install that intrusion detection system, we are being attacked far more frequently now. <laughs> and, and when he got this response from the audience, he realized, oh, I said that out loud, and he just sat down. But, you know, th these are all very necessary. We have to do it because we've been deploying fundamentally unsecure products. So we, we've been attempting to do that. But what it does, it just raises the awareness that there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there. Folks, you cannot control that. But what you can do is control your attack surface, the attack vectors. That's actually the thing you can take control of. And that's what I'd like to talk to you today about, because when you look at all the things we've been doing, I have to ask the question, how's it working for you? If, if you do not address the fundamental issues of those attack surfaces and the attack vectors, all of these are not going to make a difference. 
And that's why when we look at the fact that everyone puts in security features, and I know you've seen this slide because we've been using this now for a while, and we're seeing it's not working. What they're doing is coming after the application security within specifically the non-security of the applications. So applications within our enterprises are the favored attack vector, either through the supply chain or once we've actually operationally deployed it. Now, the fact that you're in the audience here, you actually understand some of these terms. I've had to explain it to others, but you know, the fact that we see cross-site scripting attacks, SQL injection attacks, and these are KPEC IDs. How many of you have at least heard of the common attack patterns? See, this is the only audience where I would get that kind of response. Most people just go, what's that? Well, KPEC is one of the standards I sponsored when I was in DHS, and it's, I'm going to talk to this a little bit more. But CWE was also a standard that we sponsored. So I, I was the sponsor of CVE. That's what we had. That's the grandfather of them all, common vulnerabilities and exposures. I said, you know, the challenge with that is very reactive. Somebody, you, you had a breach, we develop a patch, and we deploy it because we look around for that. Even that's not working all that great. But even so, it was a reactive mode. I said, what if we could be more proactive and understand the root causes of what's going after that? And that's why working with MITRE, I would say it's about 12, maybe 13 years ago, Bob Martin and I met at a conference and we were talking about, I said, this is what we need to do. And so CWE was born out of a conference that Bob and I were attending, the Software Technology Conference back in Utah. And so we've got to be able to do that. And, and many vendors stepped up to this. People were doing static code analysis. They were doing it. There, there were a lot of different constructs where people were already looking at it. But CWE was born out of that. But we also knew, well, why do we care about the CWEs? It's because they can be attacked different ways. And so that's why the common attack patterns. Sean Barnum came out of Sigital, and he helped us work that as well. So the industry has helped grow that. But why do you care if you have an exploitable weakness in your, if you're in your network, anywhere in your enterprise? I mean, try explaining this to your boss so that we've got this exploitable weakness and it's got that attack. Well, the reason we care about CWEs is they represent the exploit targets are vectors for future zero-day attacks. I want to be clear about that because you hear a lot of people talking about this saying, oh, we've been victimized, another zero-day attack. Well, that means that they are publicly admitting that somebody else was more committed to finding their exploitable weaknesses than they were. Because the sad fact is CWEs are identifiable and we have mitigations that go with all of them. Two-thirds of them are at the code level. So the foot stomper on that is if you're running tools, two-thirds of them can be discovered that way. And by the way, the tools are much better today because not only do they identify the specific exploitable weakness, they also have the associated mitigation. They point to the CWE that go goes to the MITRE site, and each company out there who's got tools today will say, you know, they've got, the they add their secret sauce on top of that. So there's mitigations that go with this. And that's why it's a very sad fact when somebody says they've been victimized as a zero-day attack. And we're seeing, and this has gone on for years, you know, from when I was in DHS, 92% of vulnerabilities are on the application level, not networks, even though that's where a lot of people want to focus. Over 70% of security breaches happen at the application level. That's, again, Gardner was saying that. Insufficient application security testing. It's often done at the end, but this idea of bolting on security does not work in applications. So you have to kind of build it in. That's why our website was called build in security. And it was, it's always been known that if you address those software vulnerabilities, if you move them prior to production, the cost will be greatly reduced. Uh, and so this idea is that just passing it on, well, often it's somebody else's cost that has to go with that. Uh, and 90% of the app, typical application is uh, comp comprised of open source software, or open source components. We'll talk about that more here. It, this is a supply chain issue. But data breaches exploit vulnerabilities in applications with root causes and in insecure software. In fact, 90% of all reported security incidents results from exploits against defects in software. You can say, wait a minute, no, if somebody stole the password. Actually, that's a weakness in itself if you understand our attack patterns that we've got as well, CWE. As a result of that, we, uh, I sponsored some activity here with um, understanding why it's important to understand where uh, we are. And so the standards that came out of it is because a lot of manufacturers are saying, well, just buy my product from the OEM. You'll make sure you don't have a counterfeit or unauthentic product. But the challenge is, is both counterfeit as well as authentic products can be defective. 
And more significantly, they can be tainted. And we have to have ways of measuring that taint. Just like in food and drugs, you know, taint is a state. It's not a, a point of intention. And, and we can actually get malware in a product without malicious intent from someone. So we have those standards uh, for a malware, exploitable weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and attack patterns. You notice with the red ones, we've got ITUT, which is the standards body for the United Nations, which means 109 nations recognize ITUT standards that these are actually codified in international standards. And I want to make sure that we're on a common speaking level here because we will throw around these words, vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Some people think they're one and the same. It's, well, what's the difference? Well, I will tell you, all vulnerabilities are one or more weaknesses. Weaknesses is the bigger category, and that's actually the space that CWE is in. And CVEs come in as a result of not mitigating that. And in fact, it's what makes a weakness, a vulnerability, is when there is, if you look at the very bottom line there, the existence, even if only theoretical, of an exploit designed to take advantage of a weakness or multiple weaknesses and achieve a negative technical impact is what makes a weakness a vulnerability. So all vulnerabilities are one or more weaknesses that come together. And zero days are right there in that middle is where somebody, it's a previously unmitigated weakness that are exploited with little or no warning. So it's just a common lexicon that we want to make sure that we share. And as I mentioned, these are all out there. It's uh, ITUT standards are in, in six different languages. Uh, here's the list of the ones I, I care about within the X series. Uh, and it's the Structured Cybersecurity Information Exchange Techniques. And you'll notice right in there from CVE, which also, you notice, includes the scoring systems for both the Common Vulnerability Scoring System as well as the Common Weakness Scoring System. Talk about that a little bit more as well as CPE and Mike and KPEC are in there as part of that. Uh, these are now being used in many products. In fact, there's over 300 products and services that use CVE from 152 different organizations in 25 countries. So you can't say, I don't have access to this stuff. It's a matter of picking. And you have to understand that the fact that CVEs have been growing, they've been growing exponentially. In fact, that's why we see malware is taking advantage of this. You see the growth in malware? What's the growth of CVEs that has a, a basically enabled malware to become so pervasive? And this becomes a way that you can start communicating with others. You can communicate with those in your supply chain, talking about CVEs and CWEs. If you're bringing in products from somebody else, you have to ask, are those applications being used as part of the system, or the test environment? Are they there to detect CWEs or CVEs? And are they patched for known CVEs? Uh, because that's uh, been one of our challenges. People simply aren't patching known CVEs. We're seeing new software coming out with old CVEs, stuff for which there was a patch that's been available for two, four, in some instances, eight years a patch has been available, and yet they roll out a new product with an old CVE in it. And so you can ask those questions, are any of the component libraries incorporating the systems have CVEs? We, we see the challenge is the fact that when a, a product is breached, you apply the CVE, you apply the patch, but who goes back and patches the library from whence that code came from? It's a little wonder why new stuff comes up because people are just pulling down from libraries that they hadn't patched. So these become a means by which we can share information about risk exposures throughout our software supply chain. And I've seen that many organizations have their approved list or their white list or their assessed and cleared products list. But have you ever asked how did they get on that list? Have they been tested for exploitable weaknesses? I've already explained to you what that the value is of that. If, if it's got CWEs in it, it's not the supplier who's at risk, it's me. But have they been tested for known vulnerabilities? In fact, this is the simple one. This is the low-hanging fruit. If a supplier is still providing you stuff with known vulnerabilities, they simply don't care because it's not their risk. There's no liability associated from that. But the idea that says, I'm going to accept this product, I'm going to configure it, I'm going to put it into to play, and expect me to be the one who's now going to patch it when new threats are identified against it, it's kind of a, a bit daunting in itself. 
For those of you who have ever been involved in installing an application, you configure it, it's to work on, on this platform to interoperate with these applications, and now somebody puts a patch out. You put the patch in. What happens? It breaks the configuration, right? Do you realize that there are some people out there, and this is the old idea that says compliance is not security. When you're in a compliance regime, if you're in the DOD, you get IAVAs issued. If you're some, if somebody else tells you we're going to patch CVEs that score seven or higher, which by the way, you kind of understand, what about those that score six and below? That's your new attack vector, by the way. But if what we're finding is that the people who are actually charged with keeping things up to date, who are now also charged to patch things, I actually know people who will, they get the patch in, they, they install it, they take a screenshot that says, we did it, that's the compliance, and then they un uninstall the patch. Now, I'm sure nobody in your organization does that. But have you wondered? I mean, because we put a lot of pressure on guys who have to do these things. But in the area of malware, uh, it's just, we're, we're actually seeing products come in with known malware, and then you whitelist the malware. That's kind of interesting in itself. So if you're in a DevOps environment, what are you doing to mitigate the attacks that impact your operations? Because today, while those known threat actors are out there, uh, we see the attack patterns. And that's why we, we recommend using KPEC, because it's a way of measuring the sufficiency of your test regime. But then is what they're doing. They're attacking those weaknesses that we talked about that are found in specific items or assets that you have. That's the technical impact that we have. And we can do controls today. And those system and, and software controls, we, we are always making trades. But understand that there's very good guidance that's available to you. If you go to the fact that NIST 800-160 came out in May of this year, please look at that. Appendix J is all about software assurance. It's, it's titled Software Security and Assurance. And that's where you, you basically take 800-3, you take those controls, and we've put the lens of software assurance on it. And it helps you identify those mitigating controls that you can put in place. So it's a free resource. Please go and see uh, NIST 800-160 to be able to understand what you can do to take advantage of that. And within the DevOps environment, you're taking a, a, the fact that we're seeing threats. They're going after weaknesses. You can either choose to eliminate that weakness. You can mitigate the weakness. Or you can say it's unacceptable. Uh, you can basically block it from attack. Uh, I'm going to come back and talk about that should only be viewed as a temporary measure. Or you can alarm it for attack or exploit. And, and again, you're probably already doing these kinds of things. So you're either managing risk during development, you're assessing uh, the deployment risk, you're doing operational mitigation in DevOps, and simply this idea of validating and verifying everything. That's where CWE, CVE, and KPEC come into play. Again, it helps you automate the types of things that you've already been working on. And there's a way of getting started. Many of you are familiar with the OWASP Top 10. I love this list. Why is that so good? Because number one on that, it's basically saying don't be using products with known vulnerabilities. That's using the entire list of over 76,000 CVEs. That's, that's number one. And then the others are CWEs. And then SANS uh, Top 25 CWEs, uh, that, that's a great way of getting started. The object management group has one, and I like that because these are all that can be automated. This is basically what tools enable you to do. And of course, the Verizon top 10. That's a great way of getting started if, if you don't know what else to do. But I'd say you've got something even better available to you, and that's using the common weakness scoring system to actually say, let me develop my own top end list. What's most important to me based on my environment uh, based on my deployed products and what we've got. We want to develop our own top end list of CWEs because this is based on eight different technical impacts. If it has, if, if something is breached, uh, does it have the ability to be modified, uh, the data, read data, uh, execute a denial of service attack, execute unauthorized code, gain privileges, bypass protection mechanisms, or hide activities? These are actually very important for you to talk about in terms of this with your boss. Because often your boss may not fundamentally understand software and therefore won't understand exploitable weaknesses. But when you talk in terms of these technical impacts, they'll understand that's not good. And so you should be able to do something about it. 
And so develop your own list. You can go onto the CWE website at MITRE, and they give you a lot more instructions about how you can do that as well. And the within that website, the CWE website, we talk about detection methods. Because these different CWEs can be detected by different tools. I'll exp explode that a little bit more. You go back to what I was just talking about, what the uh, the scoring system's based on. Well, there's different ways that you would detect these CWEs, either through automated analysis, uh, automated dynamic analysis, static analysis, black box fuzzing, uh, manual analysis, uh, and it goes on all the way to the white box. But it says if these CWEs are important to me, I need to make sure I can detect those. And I want to make sure in my test regime I've got that. Literally to the point of saying, I've identified what's most important to me. How am I making sure my test regime covers that? So we look at different things. We can range from code review to bringing in tools from static analysis. We even recommend that you do pen testing in a development environment because that catches a lot of things that, that, that you won't get through static analysis. What that does, it says, what kind of coverage do I have? And today the tools are much better about publicizing what we look for. We will tell you, depending on the language that we're, you're in, which CWEs does this tool find? You want to make sure you've got a toolkit that finds the CWEs that you care about. And we start with that by saying, understanding that today software is assembled. In fact, uh, within the supply chain, most of it is assembled. Uh, in your development environment, there's a whole lot of assembly going on. You're not creating new code. You're pulling down things that were already there. In fact, today, up to 90% of an application consists of third-party code. What do we mean by third-party code? It could be that free and open source software. It could be third-party code that's commercial off the shelf. But there's this first-party custom code usually is limited to probably no more than 10% of most applications. That's just a reality. But do you trust what's in your third-party code? And what we're finding is that most people are just... It's a default. Well, it's there. I can use it. And they're not checking it. Uh, and it's like, well, you've got access to the source code. You can check it. You should check it. And one of the reasons we're finding out that, uh, and this is from an operational perspective, there are many organizations who literally believe this idea that says, I can install it and forget it. And uh, this was just an example that says over time, and I'll use the term code decays. Code decays, meaning that we discover new exploitable weaknesses or vulnerabilities, and this is a graph that's showing specifically CVEs against one co code base, that over time, if you didn't patch, you've got a lot of new CVEs. In fact, in this example, 74 of these had a CVSS score of 10. And, and that means if you don't patch, your, your code is going to be more and more exploitable simply because new exploitable Weaknesses and vulnerabilities are discovered against it. I want to give you a simple example of one of the customers that we have, a uh, leading uh, network equipment manufacturer who produces 400 new products a year. They say that 99% of all their products use open source, not, and 60% of all the code is open source. And that's not unusual. But then they noted that 69% of all the security defects are from open source. This is not to be disparaging of open source, but it is to say you actually have something that you can see. And the average defect age was 441 days. Now, what does that mean? It means that there was a CVE against that for well over a year, and nobody had patched it. That means it's a risk to the end user who's there. And 10% of these had high visibility vulnerabilities that originate from open source. What do we mean by high visibility? It means the CEO gets involved. It's really tough when you have to explain to your boss and his boss and his boss why this was allowed to happen. But the reality is we have to take action today. That uh, they have to ship, they have to get out. Uh, the question is, what are you doing? And this is where I'm going to talk about a discipline that's been applied for hardware for years, and it's called sign-off. And we need to be able to implement sign-off for software. I'm going to go into more details here. But it means having that to enable advancement of technologies that ultimately produce features rather than expending too many cycles reacting to big security challenges. You want to do it up front where it's a lot easier. You already know that. And, and there's a way of doing that in a more disciplined way. 
Now, there have been a lot of studies on this. On, uh, I, I will just focus on that uh, left-hand column with uh, the, the, the study that was done by the FSISAC on third-party software security working group. They said you need to be able to focus on your uh, software development lifecycle, app testing, protocol, and policy testing, software composition analysis, and procurement language. Now, if this is the first time you've ever talked about procurement language, you need to understand why. And we, and we'll go through these. Now, we understand that there are growing challenges in software development. From There's that pressure for faster speed for development. You've got to be able to operate high velocity. Uh, you've got mul multiple sources that are being able to come. You've got to be able to track these disparate sources as they come in uh, if you're going to have a handle on it. And there's a lot of inertia. There's change culture and process is... It's painful, but it's necessary. Walt, I know you've been involved in that, just being able to help change an organization. And that's, uh, especially the not invented here, is always a big challenge. But the beauty of coming to events like this is that you're sharing with your colleagues. You're finding out that something else works for somebody else. Might we apply that and try it out on our organization? So I would recommend that you do that. But testing is going to be very important. The old adage, uh, you know, trust but verify. Well, testing becomes very important when we're dealing with software because any software processing input can be attacked, and that's regardless of what level, if it's the application level, but it's all the way down to your device drivers. And today, I will tell you that hackers are using tools to break in. They're using the binary analysis and fuzzing techniques to find your vulnerabilities. So why shouldn't you be doing it? Those guys are doing it, and you haven't even given them permission, but they've already got abilities to do that. So testing has to be done by in different places, but ultimately testing has to be done. And the best place is to ask your suppliers what they did to understand that they've done it so you don't have to. But if you don't understand what your suppliers have done, it's on you. And good luck uh, to be able, if, if you think you've got the cycles to be able to do that. And there's different types of detection methods that are out there. Uh, there was a, a report that was done uh, by the Department of Defense. This is really a good case of using OPM, that's Other Projects Money, where they, they put out the state-of-the-art report for software assurance, and they looked at different tools and techniques for de detecting the things that we care about. And so we know that different methods are effective at finding different types of weaknesses. And uh, what you want to look at is not just the output from different tools, but you also want to be able to look at both CVEs and CWEs, not just CVEs. Because I know every one of your organizations are looking at CVEs today, but you really need to take a look at leveraging the power of what CWE can do to help you understand your risk exposures. Uh, because knowing this in your code that is maintained with defects is more useful than just the result of one scan, or and multiple data points provide a much more comprehensive risk exposure. There are different types of testing. I'm sure most of you are familiar with most of these, given the fact that we've got dynamic runtime analysis. And with malformed input testing, a lot of people refer to that as fuzz testing, but there's can be much broader than that. Software composition analysis, I want to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, finding known vulnerabilities, uh, but also static code analysis. I think most everyone here has already been doing that. And, of course, uh, looking for known malware. And these tests can be used to enumerate the CVEs, CWEs, and malware. Uh, which can then be further categorized into prioritized list. Uh, within Synopsys, what we've done is actually acquired different tools and now put them together on an integrity platform. And our efforts have been not to improve just the products like Coverity. Many of you are familiar with Coverity given the scan product. If, if you are uh, supporting any open source software projects, then you should take advantage of the scan project because it's free for you to be able to do that. Uh, the website, the, the link for the URL is there. Uh, Coverity has definitely improved. Um, we now have eight languages, and there's over uh, every time there's a new release, there's new code checkers that go with that. Defensix, uh, which is protocol fuzzing, uh, you may be familiar from the, the days when Konamicon was the first to detect uh, and report on Heartbleed. That was a result of the capabilities that we had with that. Protocode actually is both for supply chain uh, as well as the uh, development side, and that's in the area of software composition analysis. Seeker, which is interactive 
uh, application security testing and abuse essay, which is for uh, threat situational awareness, and uh, which to me is very important for DevOps, and I'm going to come back and talk about why these fit together like that. Uh, there was a report that just came out last month, and I, I'm only referencing this to you as a way that you could use it as a framework, because uh, Forrester did a case study of one of our clients who use both uh, Coverity as well as Defensix in their development lifecycle. And I say use it as a framework for assessing what might you bring into your environment because it's a good way of showing the return on investment that you got for investing in any tools that you want to bring in to help justify to your organization. You'll notice on the bottom there, return on investment was 136%. Uh, the cost to find and fix bugs went down to to 10 times, depending on the individual projects. And the time to release new products went down four months. And so it improved their product quality and security. It re reduced their time to market. It prevented high-profile breaches and mitigated costly post-deployment malfunctions. The post-deployment malfunctions are re really what get companies in the news, and most CEOs would be preferred staying out of the headlines. And so you want this is one of the ways of doing that. And it also costs you a lot less to address it during development. Uh, so most people have assumed that software and systems, uh, that the security is an upstream responsibility, bearing the risk of unchecked cyber supply chain. And what we mean by that is if you look at the typical waterfall, uh, of water flow, I should say, and that's why we talk about the need for software composition analysis, is that we are using a lot of open source components uh, we, we use third-party commercial products, uh, the off-the-shelf, the proprietary products. We often have outdated, vulnerable code. There is some licensing issue. Uh, I, I think if you looked at the different open-source licensing, uh, in particular things like copy-paste uh, or copy-left, where it says, yes, you can use this product, but as soon as you incorporate it into your product, you've just made your product free and open-source. Now, there's been some big headline ones there. We don't need to discuss who they are. But imagine when you've had this very profitable product that you've been making lots of money on, and you have to go to your CEO and say, boss, we now have to give it away for free, or we're going to pay a big fine. It's, it's not the message that you want to know. So software composition analysis will help you with understanding your licensing. But all of this comes down into it. we finally open it up, the floodgate, when we finally release it. But all these things have to be accounted for in the background in your development environment before you release something new. And so software composition analysis, it does look at compiled code and determines what third-party uh, components it's built from. It queries the databases uh, that are out there for known vulnerabilities. This is what's very good about uh, identifying and reporting CVEs that are in that code. It can automatically track those vulnerabilities in the software package over time and it leverages the common vulnerability scoring system to pri prioritize your mitigation activities. And I highly recommend that you're using CVS version 3, because with version 3, it really started waking up as far as understanding. Because, you know, if Metasploit has it on its list, this is not a matter of where does it score. You need to patch it. That, that becomes a 10 automatically. Uh, when Heartbleed came out, this was only when we had version 2, Heartbleed scored five. It's kind of sad, and therefore, we actually had organizations say, well, it didn't score seven, so we're not going to patch it. And that had to be fixed to be able to do that. By the way, Heartbleed, as bad as that is, and as much news as it made, what, now two years ago, that we, we did a scan, a worldwide scan we, uh, this summer, and we found over 200,000 web application servers with unpatched open SSL. So it's like... Why not? It's because they might not have even known that they had it. And that's where software composition analysis helps you understand. So it also gives you a bill of materials. And that's what I like about this is because in order to take action in the future, you have to know what's in your, your code build. So that free and open source license management and export compliance, but the bill of materials in particular is what's very important. And a bill of materials is simply something that gives you code genetics, knowing the ingredients arms users with an enormous resource for determining your risk exposure. If you didn't know it, and like I said, when Heartbleed was unreported or they didn't know that they had it, it was an issue for them. 
So software composition analysis helps you in the area of your development teams, but it helps your legal department, and it also helps your purchasing. Uh, so you can set that, that bar. Uh, the trends, DevOps is now incorporating security. I, I don't have to tell that to the OWASP community, but if you're not already doing that, you should. Gardner came out with a report last month where it looks at uh, information security architects must integrate security at multiple points into DevOps workflows in a collaborative way uh, that is largely transparent to developers and it preserves the teamwork, uh, agility and speed of DevOps and agile development environments. Basically, they're calling it Dev Secure Ops. Uh, Josh will call it rugged DevOps. Others, you can call Whatever the idea is, you have to incorporate security in your DevOps. And Gardner was saying that by 2019, more than 70% of enterprise uh, DevOps initiatives will have incorporated automated security vulnerability and configuration scanning for open source components and commercial packages. And they're saying based on this year's, only 10% are doing that. By 2019, less than 50% of enterprise DevOps initiatives will have incorporated application security testing for custom code, but that's still going to be up from this year. And I want to get off here talking about how does this all fit together. How many of are you familiar with Sticks and Taxi? Now you've heard of it, and this is what is that? It's well, Sticks is the structured thread information expression. It was the thing that if you looked at all the standards we had, from we had CVE, CWE, KPEC, and we did Mike, and we started finding the the common sub schema was Cybox. Sticks was born as a way of supporting our operational community, and. I'm telling you that the DevOps community should leverage sticks with tools for threat modeling and uh, security situational awareness because it can incorporate security by using tools that are aligned with the uh, sticks architecture because that enables uh, scalable means for detecting threat indicators, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and exploits, and it supports your organizational processes for exchanging information among the tools. And, and that's the key, uh, that we the automation is not just about you and I talking about things, it's more about tools being able to exchange this information. The primary com components are things from what are we seeing now, so you're looking at observables, you're looking at indicators, you're looking at the incidents, you're looking at what does it do, the uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, the exploit targets, and those are the weaknesses, uh, the campaigns, the threat actors, and the courses of action. And it's important for you to understand that because in a DevOps environment, you have to say, well, what is it that we do? And we've actually structured our tools around that so that Abuse SA is in that bigger space that people normally think for uh, threat situational awareness. But with Seeker and uh, DefenseX, we, we can focus on TTPs by from fuzzing to I identify exploits that are against that. But you notice everything comes together of focusing on what is the exploit target. And that exploit target we express in terms of CVE and CWE. And it's most important that you have associated courses of action. Now, obviously, with a course of action for finding a CVE, you're supposed to patch it. For a CWE, we have mitigations that go with that. For many people today in the operational environment using sticks, they will simply say, we see a threat, here's the indicator, my course of action is to block it from attack or to close a port. Well, I view that as only a temporary thing because you know why? Most cyber assets, the real value is that they're connected. And so you want to be able to understand that while you can do all of these things, simply blocking it is not that. What you should ask the question is, what could have and should have been done to harden the attack surface or the attack vectors to prevent the target from being exploitable in the first place? So use that time of temporarily blocking it to go and mitigate the exploit target. And understand that you can actually go out and procure things correctly. And there's procurement language that's available. We've got URL there, but also the financial sector has put out their cyber insurance buying guide. And within that, they have their procurement requirements for supply chain cyber assurance. And you'll notice that they're covering the same things that I've just been talking about. You actually have procurement language that you can have with your suppliers to discuss that. And the organization who's using that today is Underwriters Labs with their new cybersecurity assurance program where they're looking at reducing weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And the standards that are out there uh, from the general requirements, the industry-specific requirements, and they started with industrial control systems and medical devices. And the one that we're developing right now is organizational processes. So again, 
they're looking at the same things I've just been talking with here today. So at the end of all of this, you can actually start focusing on sign-off as a way of incorporating these different techniques uh, from code check-in, compile and build, your feature readiness, your product release. You can do that both in development as well as your supply chain. And the ingredients range from your technologies, your methodologies, and your training that you're doing with your people. But at the end of the day, the benefits everyone. It benefits not just your development team. It benefits not just your supply chain. It benefits your CEO because he's now in a better position, he or she, to uh, manage risks, focus on the competitive advantages as accountability. Purchasing organizations can look at cost management, compliance, and quality. And, and getting off the stage, as I know you want to hear, is that software supply chain lifecycle management today is very important because software is no longer written, it's being assembled. Uh, testing is required to understand risk exposures uh, that are attributable to tainted components within software. Enterprises today are looking for vulnerabilities at a time they build and deploy, yet many of the security vulnerabilities emerge over time, enabling uh, software to decay. And software composition analysis <laughs> provides a high-level impact in security, liability, and risk mitigation for its adopters. It reduces risk introduced by the inclusion of third-party components. Software sign-off is that way throughout the life cycle as a way of providing a secure, safe, and risk-free experience. And obviously, secure or rugged DevOps is required to enable enterprise resilience and re reduce your attack vectors. I applaud you for your organizational efforts for what you're doing. I applaud you for the fact that you're here sharing with your colleagues uh, because you can take back the experiences of this and say, I learned something from some of the people here and try to apply it there and then come back and share your lessons learned. Appreciate the opportunity for being able to come out here.